Okay, it looks like we're all just about here, so we're ready to get started. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, we will be in here until about 2.40, and don't forget there is another uh, few fast-track sessions after this uh, specific session and back in the Coral Ballroom. Um, so this, is, uh, this session topic is broadband. Um, I'm Keith DeMello. I'm a senior communications manager with the Office of Information Management and Technology, OIMT, or OIMT, as was, I guess, it's been rebranded since the, our comedian um, during session. Um, just a reminder, please uh, turn off your cell phones or put them on buzzer. Um, don't have to turn them off, just put them on buzzer. And if you do need to leave the room, you, you're allowed, but if you could do so quietly. Um, and we'll try to get you out of here on time. Uh, I'll be introducing our three guest speakers today. Uh, they'll, they each have uh, individual presentations. And then at the end, we'll take about 15 minutes or so Q&A. So uh, to begin, um, again, as I mentioned, this uh, session is titled The Impact of Broadband. And uh, the session is described as, as the internet con continues its transfer transfer transformation from a web of information to a web of connected people and things, the bar has been raised for designing infrastructure that is up to the task so that no one is left behind. Broadband, wireless, unified access, digital learning, and public safety present both challenges and unprecedented opportunities. This session focus on, focuses on game-changing innovations and advances un, that are currently underway with Hawaii. And also, if I could add that we, we're also keeping pace with um, evolving demand, um, broadband versus wireless access and mobile access. Um, there is an evolving need, evolving demand that uh, I think our, our focus also needs to keep pace with. Oh, looks like false alarm. So I, be I believe we're going to begin with Jason. Jason Toon, uh, Director of Network Planning Hawaiian, at Hawaiian Telecom. He's center. So we're going to go out of order if you could forgive us for that, but we'll keep you on your toes. Uh, Jason is, um, he oversees the team responsible for the strategic planning, capital bud budgeting, and implementation of the company's telecommunications, TV, high-speed internet, voice, and fiber optic optics network. He has a 10-year ten tenure at Hawaiian Telecom, um, including oversight of its data centers, da desktop themes, operational support systems, as well as telecommunications, equipment, I mean, the, the gamut. And then following Jason will be uh, David Lau. I, David's closest to me. And uh, David is Network Applications Engineer 2 for Level 3 Communications, uh, which is based in Honolulu. Uh, he has been in the information technology industry since uh, 1984. And he has worked for the University of Hawaii, Software Plus, Software House International, uh, TD Food Service, um, let's see, Time Warner Telecom, yes. and then uh, prior to Level 3, and he's worked in a wide area of network deployment throughout the United States as well as Guam and Saipan. And then our final speaker uh, will be uh, Chris Zane, Network Engineer Manager, Information Technology Services for the University of Hawaii. And he's basically going to give an update on uh, the broadband initiative there at UH. And without further ado, uh, Jason, go ahead and take it away. And I'll, we're going to be using this mic. Up to you. I'll stand behind the table. OK. All right, good afternoon. So before I get started, David, Chris, and I talked about how we were going to present uh, this particular session to the audience. Uh, because we have different points of view, but our message is the same. So broadband obviously impacts everyone at certain levels, and what we wanted to do was give a macroscopic view, go towards how does it map to somebody in their home or at their business, and then talk about it from a government perspective. So that's the approach that we're going to take, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So how does broadband get to Hawaii? And for those of you who were at the Digital Summit last year, one of the key focus items that we talked about was getting broadband to Hawaii. And in that presentation, we talked about 
the state actually running out of bandwidth by 2018 if we didn't do anything such as landing more trans-Pacific cables. Fortunately, within this year alone, uh, two agreements were signed to land and run cables uh, to Hawaii from the South Pacific as well as Asia going towards the mainland. That gives us more than enough bandwidth uh, to last for the 20 plus years. And it's not for just the service providers, but it's also for government agencies as well. Uh, just to let you know, prior to landing these cable agreements, uh, about three or four cables were actually ran completely past Hawaii. Uh, if some of you read the articles in the Star Advertiser or follow IEEE, the first Trans-Pacific cable actually had to land in Hawaii. And as early as the early 2000s, that's no longer needed based on the, advance, based on the advancements in technology. So once you get your broadband to Hawaii, what do you do with it? Obviously, when you have a cable landing station where all your internet goes to, you need to get to the other islands. And so to get the bandwidth to Kauai, Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island, there's two ways. One is radio, and the other is an undersea fiber optic cable. And in the earlier days, in the 90s, radio was actually a very good solution to use because it's highly reliable and there's a lot of bandwidth. The unfortunate part with radios and going cross island is that there's a limited number of frequencies and the bandwidth is limited. You can only do up to about 150 megabits per second, which really isn't that much these days, given that companies such as Oceanic and Hawaiian Telecom are offering speeds almost comparable to that to the home. So your really only true option is undersea fiber optic cables. And of course, there's only three cables uh, within Hawaii that traverse all the islands. One is uh, Sandwich Isles, one is uh, Hyphen, and the third one is Hicks. And all providers share some kind of bandwidth on that to give on-island customers uh, some form of bandwidth and diversity. So the real challenge with that is, how do we get to other parts of the island once you land there? Uh, so take Kauai, for example. Nobody's really going to run a cable to Keikaha or Princeville from Oahu because it just costs more money. So your on-island landing points are the closest point to Oahu. So when you run into fiber cuts uh, or natural disasters, reaching out to a Princeville or a Keikaha is, becomes really difficult. So without some form of government intervention, where there's a, either a mandate or subsidies to get diversity on island, we'll, continu we'll continue to have these types of uh, challenges in the future. So now that I've talked a little bit about getting the broadband at least to the island, how does it get to the business or home? And one of the Hawaii Broadband Initiative's biggest uh, goals at the time was to get one gigabit to the home by 2017. It's not going to become a true reality, but at least the vision is there to get there. And what we want to do is make sure that we can cover the underserved and unserved communities. Those are typically the highest cost areas to get to, whether it's the Big Island, places in Hana, or on Kauai, or Molokai, or Lanai. There's the population that's there doesn't support a enterprise level type of investment from a level three or a Hawaiian telecom or an oceanic. So the only way to get there is to do partnerships with other government agencies or get uh, federal grants. So uh, as an example, there's a, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of universal service fund that was being used to provide phone service to rural communities. What the FCC is doing now is they're actually repositioning uh, that money to provide broadband in rural communities and they're actually looking at uh, issuing out grants to all 50 states to build out at least 10 megabits to uh, all rural areas. So given that my part is done, I'm going to pass it off to David. He's going to bounce off of what I've talked about um, to talk about how the infrastructure is set up uh, to support broadband in Hawaii. Thank you. So Jason brought it up a bit. So with uh, about three years ago, 2011, right, the announcement for the affordable one gig internet bandwidth to the home, to individual households. Uh, 
Anybody do the math on that? How many households do we have here in Hawaii? One gig to each. Um, do we need that? All of that to be undersea capacity? Or there, there's some thoughts to that, and there's been some dis at least discussions among people I've talked to um, whether that needs to be undersea capacity total or just on island capacity. Keep that in mind. Okay. Um, there's a whole bunch of other questions too, like how we're going to get it there. Um, is the capacity attainable? Uh, I've got a real simple slide toward the end of my deck that kind of shows that we're almost to the point where we can get it. Right? Um, we Level 3 primarily works with institutions, uh, enterprise-based business, small, medium businesses. We don't normally do the residentials. We do some, but not typically. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see from my standpoint what's happening, at least on the residential front. Uh, I was telling Jason that I'm waiting for them to get fiber to my condo building so I can get that type of speeds at home. Um, I would be nice to have that kind of speed outside of my office. Okay. Um, next slide. So this is an old slide. Okay. What, do you use, what do we use broadband for? This slide actually came out, I believe, right when HBI was uh, um, announced initially. And this is what happens in the Internet Minute. If you look at it, going from the far side, just real quickly, at the time, it's 639,800 gigabytes of global IP data. That's internet traffic. This is three years ago. Okay? We're in the terabyte range now. And that, that only goes up, and that's only three years ago. Okay? The bulk of it, as you're coming forward to the front, YouTube is the front of that. Okay? I probably wouldn't say YouTube's the leader in the usage of the internet bandwidth, but video definitely is. Uh, who hasn't watched something on Netflix? Or who hasn't seen something? Everybody's got smartphones, right? Who doesn't have one in here? Okay. Who hasn't watched a video on here? Right. Okay. No hands raised. So can't imagine something like that. Something, especially in HD. HD has basically increased the need for bandwidth by a factor of eight at least. Okay. And that only gets better because there's 4,000K TVs coming out now. Just imagine the bandwidth for that when we get to that point. Okay. Um, bottom left, look at this slide. Like I said, this slide was done in 2011, I believe. Uh, today, the number of network, network devices equals the global population, 2011. By 2015, that's next year, next month, okay, it says number of network devices is going to be twice the global population. I think it's actually going to be above that. Okay. And we'll see more of why that, will, why that is in a bit. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. How does Hawaii connect to the internet? Um, Hawaii is kind of in the middle of that. This is kind of cool, covers what Jason was also speaking about. Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific where those four lines south, just north of the equator connects. Uh, this is actually an old level three map that doesn't show uh, the older TW acquisition undersea fiber. So there's actually more than this. Uh, the network is global. Over this rides, last stat I got was this covers 60% of the global internet traffic right now. That's what rides over this network. Okay. What do we need to get to that one terabit, or one gigabit? It'd be nice for one terabit. <laughs> one gigabit to the home. On the left, what you see is a copper in a conduit. Uh, this was done, this happened a couple years ago, so glad we got pictures of it. <laughs> you weren't the only one affected, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We need to move from that older technology. Honolulu is an older city. Okay? No matter what we say, or no matter how happy we are with what things going, Honolulu is an older city. We have a lot of older infrastructures that needs to be, uh, I'd hate to say ripped out, but changed. What we need to get is from that older copper technology to that fiber. And that's happening. That's slowly happening, but it, it's getting there. This is, um, I, did, I just threw this together in like a couple of minutes just to show you what the infrastructure looks like. So on the left, we have a cable station, undersea cable station. That's feeding uh, IP internet protocol POP or an ISP or any of the large telecom providers. Um, there's a central office distribution point. All that stuff in the red is fiber optics. So we're there. Part of that leg is there. That last mile between the distribution point and the house that is 
primarily copper, but it's slowly moving to fiber. Okay. Um, Hawaiian Telecom delivers fiber to home in some areas, not all areas, but in some areas. So that's getting there. They're not at the one gigabit speeds yet, but it'll get there. Technology, the technology will get there. The demand, right? In the US, demand drives uh, supply. Okay. So what would it take to get there? Internet usage only goes up. Who, ha who here has told their ISP, I don't want that much bandwidth, I want, I want less, right? Okay. Um, terrestrial infrastructure is dated. Upgrades are coming, but slowly, but we'll get there. Uh, this is a big part here, this next one. Consider the one gigabit local traffic. Do we need all the undersea uh, capacity? We'll, we'll definitely need a lot, but not all. What if we do it such that the data centers here take care of a large portion of your needs? For instance, everybody who here doesn't know that Google has cache servers here now? Okay. That's been turned up. Um, and, and this is coming from stuff I've worked on and trace routes I've done. Microsoft has turned up servers here locally. You don't need to cross an undersea uh, going from here to the west coast to get access to Microsoft servers or certain services. I'm sure they'll be adding on more and more as they go along, but things are coming up and changing. Um, that's a big thing, that there's 2,500 plus miles between Hawaii and the West Coast. There's no way around the laws of physics, so there's gonna be latency no matter what. Best thing to do is get that service here so you're not accessing all that undersea capacity. You won't need it for the most part. You'll still need it because there are gonna be services that's not gonna be available here in the data centers, but you'll get it eventually. Okay. So we have the Amazon put a center here? Amazon does not have a center here. Okay. Neither does quite a few other places, but um, Hawaii is, in the U.S., Hawaii is the furthest west of anything. Uh, I, my guess is Netflix will probably pop something here soon. Right. You, have the law, you, know, you have U.S. laws here. That's, if, remember back when uh, the film industry was doing a lot of filming in Hawaii? There's a reason why they did that, because it's a, it's a, US, it's a U.S. state, right? We have U.S. laws. We're, we're protected by the U.S. military government. Uh, state and federal agencies, that same protection happens, or at least from the, the digital rights side, for distribution of media. And you're starting to see a lot of that type of stuff. So I expect, this is just conjecture on my part, the Netflix to put a pop here in the new future, probably. Okay. And I know I say we want to keep that traffic local, but we need un more undersea capability. That's gonna happen no matter what. It's already happening. Jason's spoken of two uh, undersea cable systems that's, that's signed and coming in. There'll be more. I have spoken, I've had inquiries from South, the South Pacific Island Nations ISPs have made a lot of requests. They do not want to traverse all the way to the West Coast and then bounce back to Hawaii and then go back to wherever they need to for routing IP bond. They wanna to come to Hawaii, they wanna appear here. DR Fortress, has a DRF exchange, a peering point here, where they can route traffic. That's becoming a kind of a, in discussions I've been in, that's becoming a nice turnaround area for half the distance, okay? Um, and like Jason says, what's needed is partnerships. We're not, no one's gonna be able to do this alone. It's expensive uh, to land an undersea cable across, uh, across the ocean. We're talking hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Okay. No one corporation typically does alone. It's usually all partnerships. That's going to be the same thing that's happening locally. Okay. At least to date. Who knows? If somebody's got the money and is willing to fund it, we can all hope, right? All right, thanks. So uh, I'm here to give a uh, quick status of the uh, state of Hawaii broadband with the uh, slight UH bias. Uh, um, back in 2010, the university applied for two federal grants um, coming out of the Department of Commerce, the National Telecommunications Information Association. Um, it was a uh, ARA grant, which is American Reinvest and Recovery Act. Um, it was called BTOP for Broadband Technology Opportunities Program. And there was two, two grants that we applied for. The first was the infrastructure grant, uh, which is focused on community anchor institutions, which would be schools, hospitals, libraries, uh, higher ed sites, um, community colleges. And it also focused on underserved areas. 
The second one was a public computing center grant, which was to uh, put public computing access into areas that people could use, like libraries or, or things like that. Um, the infrastructure grant, we partnered with DCCA, the DOE, the libraries, um, ICSD, and Oceanic uh, to focus on building fiber optic connect connectivity to community anchor, uh, community anchor institutions, so CAIs. Um, we didn't really focus on the underserved areas, um, primarily because we were a middle mile uh, grant um, recipient, which focused on the infrastructure in between um, the segments and not the last mile, which was the infrastructure going to the, the end sites. Um, the public computing center, again, the, we partnered with the libraries to roll computers out to the libraries uh, to get uh, you know, free access to users out in the communities. So the BTOP infrastructure grant, um, UH engineered the optical network and the design of it. Uh, we worked with the DOEs, the DOE, libraries, and ICSD for installation across uh, three years. It was actually a three-year project from 2010 to 2013. But the first year, we were tied up with an environmental assessment um, study. So we could not do any construction until year two. Uh, so we built fiber, well, Oceanic and its contractors built fiber to 311 sites across six islands in two years, which is absolutely amazing. Um, I don't think we get, ever do that again. We pulled out all the stops. And thank you to Hawaii Intel for approving all of our joint pull applications. <laughs> Um, we hit, or well, the goal was to hit every public school, library, and higher education institution in the state. We almost got there. I think we were one library short and a couple dozen, maybe a dozen schools short. Um, we basically ran out of time. There was infrastructure problems getting to the schools. They would have to put in new conduits. Um, and we found alternate means of connectivity, which would be wireless or other means. Um, the plan was to expand the existing dark fiber INET network that the state currently uses. So we are now up to 381 sites between the libraries, the DOE, and the UH. And then the state ICSD has a couple dozen sites as well. So this is a shared fiber network around uh, every island. Uh, we run 1 gig, 2.5 gig, and 10 gigabit wavelengths uh, across all of these. Um, dark fiber links. Uh, each entity runs their own IP network, and we just share the, uh, the wavelengths or the, the fiber and run individual wavelengths on it. The Public Computing Center grant uh, installed 700 new computers into all 50 libraries across the state. This also included software and hardware and training for the staff to then provide training to the uh, public coming in. The grant also paid for Wi-Fi access in every public library, and it used the BTOP infrastructure that was built for the uh, transport back to the library's uh, main Salt Lake Data Center. So the impacts from BTOP, uh, we increased the fiber capacity of locations around the state. Uh, the Big Island, for example, we are on the way, or we, we, we helped Oceanic build uh, capacity across the saddle, and we're almost to Kona. Uh, so that would, in, that would uh, complete the loop around Kona to Big Island and, and back to Kona. Um, that should be completed, I would say, within the next year, hopefully. Um, Molokai and Lanai, we brought in 10 gigabits of bandwidth from what used to be known as Wavecom. It's now Hawaiian Tel. Um, and that connected all of the, the community anchoring institutions uh, on those islands back to the networks on Oahu at 10 gigabits per second. Uh, we almost got to Hana. Um, we ran out of time. There are about two or three dozen easements that we had to go through. Uh, and we just, we ran out of time. The, the grant ended in 2013 and we, we kind of gave up towards the end because there was no way we would have finished in time which is really, really unfortunate, because right now Hana is served by microwave capacity only. So increasing bandwidth, the, the incre increase of bandwidth to the end user is based on economics, like David had mentioned. Uh, users will pay for speeds that they want and what they can afford. So the state isn't in the broadband provider business, so we're not going to deliver one gig to your desktop at home uh, on the state's dime. So 
we, we need the, the uh, economics you know, to work out and the demand to be there and then the providers will hopefully build it. Um, there's, there's probably a whole lot of other stuff in there that we're, we're going to glance over. So what can the state do? So the state can um, streamline permitting and the ability to build out networks and, and you know, basically cut the red tape. Uh, that's what the state can do. The other one is provide more state, line, state online resources, such as the ehoi.gov site. I mean, if we get the demand or the services out there that users can use, there'd be more demand for broadband. Uh, UH is doing that with its online learning, its student services, and distance education. All of that runs over our IP networks, and the, the students from home can access that through their broadband, broadband providers as well. Okay, what, what we'd like to do now is open up uh, the discussion to questions. Since we do have only the one mic, what I'd like to propose is that if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll point to you if you could try to speak loudly and I'll give the mic to our presenters here. If each of you, um, depending on which, whether you're gonna take the question specifically, if you could also repeat the question so that we could, we're videotaping this as well, um, so that we, we record it. So um, I'll hand off the mic to you. So his question was, what areas that are underserved or unserved on the Big Island that are eligible to be upgraded? In some cases, there are no areas on the Big Island that can get high-speed broadband service. So to answer your question, what I can tell you from an investment standpoint is that um, Hawaiian Tel has applied for and received federal grants for Connect America, and what that allows for is uh, money to provide internet service to unserved and underserved areas uh, at a minimum of four megabits down and one megabit up. The new FCC uh, rules that's coming out for Connect America is actually 10 megs down and one meg up. So we're gonna try to design our network to meet that specific requirement. Um, and this is all public information on the FCC website. So they listed the census blocks that we would have to build to in the next um, three years. And in fact, there's one area that we need to finish this year. So Orchid Land in the Keao area is one. Okay, so <laughs> Orchid Land in Pohaku, that's scheduled for this year. Um, next year, we're looking at, and this is all Connect America grants, uh, in the Mililii Papa area in South Kona, Hawaiian Ocean View Estates on the south side, and then on the west side of the Big Island, Hawaiian Acres, Fern Forest, Glenwood, Inaloa. I think I'm missing one or two, but it's all in that. Uh, yeah, it's all in that kind of near Mountain View uh, area. So that doesn't mean that's all that Hawaiian or even Oceanic's gonna do. There's quite a bit of work that we're doing at the city and county level there um, to find ways where we can get broadband to more rural areas. Um, if we just rely just on federal grants, we won't get there in time for everybody to get their broadband internet. So the only way to do it uh, is through private uh, public partnerships. So I had somebody ask me today, somebody in Commonwealth asked me for a gigabit of internet access. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I got nothing in there, but I'll go ask. <laughs> so that's a good information. Um, I just, I know, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but I, I just asked Jason what his uh, undersea capacity for internet was, uh, back to the West Coast or what have you. I'm not sure if you know that. Uh, I was just trying to get an idea, at least from us, from the two here, what, what we have today, right, for IP capacity. Do you know? That I have to go back and research. <laughs> okay, so Jason says he has to go find out. I know for level three, we have, um, at this point, just above 140 gigabits. Uh, we're, we have another 80 gigabits coming online in January. That's just one provider. And that's probably not enough. Definitely not, even if we triple that with say three or four providers, that's, that may not be enough. Okay. So that's more of a kind of a point toward you need to centralize data servers, more server farms and data centers here for that type of stuff. Okay. Uh, so the question was the state, uh, the last presenter, which would be me, um, was going over dark fiber. So as, as part of the cable franchise agreement uh, with Oceanic and Hawaiian Tel, uh, the state and its um, departments are entitled to access 
certain types of bandwidth around the, uh, the islands, whether it be dark fiber or um, circuits that are provided at no charge to the state. So in, in terms of dark fiber, we have dark fiber uh, connectivity between state facilities and the state departments, which would be ICSD, the DOE, the libraries, and university, um, light these uh, fiber strands with uh, optical wavelengths to provide connectivity between the sites. Um, the Hawaiian Tel franchise agreement, um, the state departments get, um, you know, capacity or lease line circuits between uh, certain locations of their choosing. Do you know if there's been any sort of um, improvements on the security of where the vipers coming in? Yeah, so uh, I actually remember talking about that at last year's uh, uh, forum, and that question was asked to both um, Keone and myself. And so we really try to be inconspicuous where these uh, beach manholes are located. Um, but typically, if somebody, if a, if somebody wanted to do some type of uh, significant damage, uh, they would kind of have to do a lot. These things are encased in inches to feet of concrete and they're buried way under um, under sand so at least when you get close to the shoreline it's not like it's just lying on top of something and somebody can just drag an anchor and and yank it out uh, what I can tell you is that uh, for some of the military uh, installations um, in fact just right outside the Hilton Hawaiian village they actually seal their manholes and put a lock on it uh, and even then there's always ways to pen. There's always ways to get in and, and penetrate things. Um, you know, David showed the picture of the the copper wires that got cut. Actually, earlier this year, uh, Hawaiian Telecom sealed a bunch of manholes where we've been getting a lot of copper vandalism. Welded it shut and put locks on it, and people still came in and, and took it out. So there's no such thing as 100% safe and secure. But the main thing that we can do is try to limit our risk and exposure as much as as possible. So for right now, all we're doing is just making sure that uh, the beach manholes stay in a place that's inconspicuous and um, putting as much in, uh, concrete or other types of um, protection around it. You know, the funny thing was you said that if there was a terroristic type attack, communication is one of the first things that they're going to go after. The only way you're going to do that, and, and there's no such thing as 100% safety in the, for that. You, the only way to do it really is diverse cables, diverse systems. I hope the idea is at least one or two survives and get that infrastructure that way. Yeah. That's, that's at least planning wise, that's what happens. How much of a factor in moving us forward is how people use the internet, how they get to it, mobile versus landline, what, you know, is it a factor in how do we adapt to it or how have we? Uh, in answer, in, to answer that question, uh, just bandwidth is bandwidth, people, you know, like I said, it goes up. No one ever asks for less, right, uh, in usage wise. Mobility-wise, uh, going back two, three years, the wireless carriers were asking for, they started asking for 50 megabits to the towers, individual towers, right? They don't always backhaul their traffic on the wireless spectrum. Their fiber optics or copper on the ground to their distribution centers, their pops, where they're routing the traffic call, the internet data, whatever. It's, that's one use. Um, what else is using that bandwidth? Your refrigerator. Remember the old commercial a while back, a couple of years ago, that says, "Tell your refrigerator what you've got, and it'll go and order the stuff, and or it'll let you know when it's out, or it'll order for you, and you go pick it up, or whatever." That's think of that. That's I don't think that's happened yet, but your TV, your DVD player, your your DVR, or media player. Who's got one of those? Uh, who's got a Apple TV? That stuff streaming, right? That's all video. Think of how we've watched TV now. Who watches TV on time anymore? Who watches when the thing is broadcast live? You've got a DVR, you've got Netflix, you've got, or you're watching off of Hulu, Hulu Plus, whatever. You're watching things on your time, right? Before it used to be, if you want to see a show, and this might be dating myself, you had to go home and watch it, or record it, or remember to program VCR or something like that, okay? 
that kind of shift in thinking and, and, and availability, time schedule, whatever, you're not only changing how your time is being used, but where you're watching it. You're streaming it now to your phones, your iPads, your tablets, or computers, or anything like that. That all uses bandwidth, right? That's why I'm thinking this stuff is, it's, it never goes down. It's like letting a genie out of the bottle. You, there's no way to cork it again. Uh, one of the things that I've seen the most happen uh, recently is the increase in demand for upload speeds and putting things into the cloud. So obviously to get to the cloud, you need to have an internet connection or a data connection and consuming it, like what David talked about, watching your Netflix or your YouTube, you're consuming a lot of it. But we have a lot of businesses now that don't want to store their information locally. They need to have a place to back it up. Well, that means you're uploading something somewhere. So a lot of people think, of, think about that at the end after they've purchased their service or when they start backing up their data. And the thing to think about is, okay, yes, I know I'm pulling a lot of data and consuming a lot of it. Now I have to get it out of where my employees or my data centers are and put it somewhere else. So that's where I'm seeing a lot of the, the increase in demand goes. And unfortunate, or depends who you ask, we consume a lot of the same data. Everybody's watching the latest Netflix movie, but as far as uploading data, David's going to upload pictures of his family. I'm going to upload pictures of my dog, and Chris may upload something else. So the data that's being uploaded is going in all different directions, which adds a little bit of complexity from a service provider standpoint. So from the university standpoint, um, a lot of our data is research driven. Uh, we have the telescopes in Mauna Kea and Haleakala, and a lot of that data is being pushed over to other research institutions around the world. So the PanStars data on Haleakala, for example, we, we have three gigabit per second streams that run 24 by seven um, out of our, our data centers on either on, uh, on campus or off the, um, the Maui High Performance Computing Center. So we need a lot of you know, huge pipes leaving the state to get to the West Coast or even to Asia and in international locations. Um, so it, it, we don't have all the small you know, individual residential uh, folks choking up our pipes. We have these huge data sets that are being transferred and they're transferring you know, continuously throughout the day. Oh, then, yeah, the, well, we have the um, Aloha Cable Observatory, ACO. So that, that uh, used the, oh, was the Hall 4 cable, I think, right? Or, so they basically cut off the old Hall 4 cable, which is coming out of Makaha, and the UH research um, group stuck a sled down there, and they're, they're doing um, listening as well as, uh, I think, video, uh, real-time streaming. So um, it's not a whole lot of data coming back, but when uh, a lot of people are accessing that video stream at the same time, uh, it, it chews up bandwidth going out to the, um, to the, uh, the uh, when it's, uh, not the internet per se, the internet too, which is running over separate pipes. So, so you talked about kind of like shifting demand you know, on the consumer side. On the provider end, are you seeing a shift? I mean, we've kind of been used to this pay a flat rate, buffet style pricing, but I've heard rumors, you know, there's highest pays and stuff we're talking about charging for your usage. Are you seeing a trend towards that when it relates to internet usage? You can go. <laughs> um, what we do a lot of at level three is we, besides supplying enterprises, institutions, uh, small, medium businesses, we also supply ISPs to a certain extent. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that yet. I, I think that's starting to ask. And then I think a lot of that is prep work for the net neutrality, because that's going to change pricing completely. Um, it's going to be, I have, you know what, I, not knowing how that's going to go, or that's going to, that's a whole nother shift in, in how we see and use broadband. Um, that essentially for those who aren't aware net neutrality if that goes away, basically you, there could be multiple fees by the provider or the people who provide content. If they wanted to say provide video, video will get charged more for or um, traffic, 
because they're using up more of the bandwidth. Yeah. Or you could give it a higher speed. You can give it more priority passing through the network versus, say, normal usage for a website. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating different classes of um, entities, right? So you're going to be the ones that who have, essentially like nowadays, you're going to have the ones that have and have nots. Yeah, because they're going to be, especially startups, because you're not going to build, startups won't be able to afford the higher bandwidth or the higher traffic speeds. But I think that's that's kind of, I think part of that is going to be rumors because that's kind of starting up for that. But I, from our standpoint, we haven't seen really a lot of that yet. <laughs> The microphone got handed to me. So the question, the question was, uh, I have two smart TVs on an iPad. What is the right bandwidth for me? And uh, I know if my sales uh, consumer salesperson was here, they would definitely give you an answer. Uh, my answer to that is, it really depends on two things. And to me, the most important thing is the value proposition. Do you believe that you're getting enough internet and bandwidth to support all the things that you're doing. The, the, interest, the metaphor that I really like to use is you don't know what you need or want unless you actually try it, try it out. So for those of you who own smartphones, once upon a time there was, yeah, I don't need a smartphone, I don't need an iPhone, you know, what am I going to do with that? I just need my phone to call people. And then all of a sudden, people get their iPhones or their droids, and it's like, you know, I can't live without it. So unless you actually experience what that's like, you really don't know what you need or what you want to have. And I know that's a really ambiguous answer, but every, every person out there um, is different. So it goes back to a little bit about what you're planning on doing with the internet. If you're going to do a lot of streaming and if you're going to do a lot of uploading, and you have kids in the house and they have to be online and everybody's online at the same time, if you don't want them to have buffering or latency, then I would suggest getting a higher uh, internet package. And it doesn't matter who you're purchasing it from, the more bandwidth you have, the more devices you can actually um, manage at one time. In fact, uh, we gave a presentation in March um, to, uh, uh, property management expo and one of those questions came up and actually they expect by the end of next year for every home to have 10 connected devices which is double what was out there three or four years ago and each one of those things is consuming bandwidth it's kind of like leaving the light on in your house the more lights you have on in your house the more electricity you're going to use I have a, uh, something little to add on top of that so if you have multiple devices, you probably have to have a router or a firewall, hopefully firewall, right? Everybody has some type of firewall guarding their homes. Um, use that. Take a look at what you're using it for, right? Um, most of them have at least a decent usage graph so you can see what's being used. Uh, if you're connecting via Wi-Fi, it's self-limiting. Your Wi-Fi only works at certain speeds depending on how far you are from your access points, right? You don't need one gigabit if your Wi-Fi connection is only like five megs, right? And you're not using, the max you can get is five megs, right? Depending on how far you're away from it, how many walls you're passing through. Your TV, if it's doing updates for firmware, it's not gonna use that much. If you're using to stream videos, especially high definition video, yes, that's gonna add to it. But the only way you're gonna know is if you take a look at your usage, right? At least get, start looking at that and start getting a baseline. That, that will probably end up determining where you want to buy in at as far as bandwidth. Um, again, back to the what the market will bear as far as, or what you will, what you accept as far as a charge for bandwidth. Right. So, so from a, um, a a bandwidth perspective, a lot of it also depends what you're doing. Um, if you're uploading a lot of data, uh, if you saturate your upload speeds, your download speeds are going to suffer, even though you're not you're not downloading everything at this at that time. Uh, and that's that's mostly due the way due to the way the uh, TCP IP protocol works. Um, if you can't send the acknowledgments back that you got the packet coming down because your upload is saturated, it's it's not going to get down to you. So if if your if your kid is uploading a video to YouTube because they posted something and you're trying to download the website, and you're not going to get that very quickly. So a lot of it is the upload speeds or you know what you're uploading.
It's already happening. I mean, look at Akamai. Everybody knows what Akamai is, right? They're essentially a content delivery network service type. Their their servers, their caching servers, have been in the net in the internet network for years, decades. Um, Google has theirs here now. We're starting to see other company stuff bring here. Um, essentially, that's an out to me as an outgrowth of the, con the CDN, right? content delivery networks. That stuff. Essentially, what you're doing now is you're having centralized or large server farms that hold content delivery via via broadcast, software updates, uh, apps that you're downloading to your phone, and things like that that are uploaded to a central master server from that company and then uploaded to these repositories scattered across the world, right? Because no sense keeping it only heavy in one side and the rest of the world or the rest of the areas can't get to it, right? So you need to... Again, we're back to the physics thing, right? If every, let's say all the CDN servers are in the US, how are you going to get your thing over to the UK, right? Again, we have that physics limitation. Latency is an issue and it has to be accounted for, right? The only way to really do it is to push those out, right? More to um, regionalized areas, that type of things, right? Hawaii's in a pretty good spot for that, right? Being the center of everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to echo what, what David's saying. So uh, from what I've seen, and from a service provider perspective, there's many advantages to doing caching. Uh, one is it doesn't cost a lot of money. Secondly, it saves money because now there's less bandwidth that we need to purchase from other providers because now all that bandwidth is locally stored. The biggest advantage is for all the end users and the customers out there. Uh, and I'm going to keep going on talking about Netflix because it's the easiest example. If you want to watch the latest and greatest movie and 10 other people in the room want to watch it, if we didn't have caching, all that data would go back to the mainland. And by the way, as David mentioned, it, there's a lot of latency. So you're going to get buffering. Your quality be, may not be as high. And it turns into a poor user experience. So. Obviously, from a Hawaiian Telecom standpoint, well, I think the, I think the problem's with my internet, so I'm going to call Hawaiian Telecom. So we want to give customers a great experience as well by, if we store the content locally, those same 10 people have almost instant access to that movie. It doesn't buffer. It starts right away. And we can use the bandwidth that was for that movie for other content that really isn't stored here locally. So from my perspective, whoever is not Whoever is providing the content, whether it be uh, Google's or even uh, companies like HBO, and this is just Jason talking, more of that content will be distributed out. And it's just like the internet. The internet was never meant to be a centralized uh, network. It was always meant to be a distributed network. So what you see as far as everybody being connected together, the content itself will also spread out. Uh, speaking from my experience, for you can get away without managing class of service by or quality of service by throwing bandwidth at it. As long as you don't have any choke points, you're okay. Uh, which means we need that one gigabit to the home thing soon. Uh, who's used, who hasn't used Skype or some type of voice software? That, things like that, if you have choke points, stuff like that, will, will, the experience is not gonna be good. You'll have stuttering, like Jason said, you'll have um, dropouts, you'll have clip speech. Uh, gets worse when you're doing Skype videos, FaceTime, yeah. or I don't know if there, Droid has a similar app to FaceTime, but things like that now all, that's not over the wireless. You, FaceTime, when it first started, you couldn't do it over your cell provider's um, spectrum. You had to connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot and then work it that way. There's a reason for that. Their net, the, wi the wireless provider's networks are getting saturated also, and especially by that type of um, usage. Right? They're all starting to see it. Um, I was thinking of one thing that came up. If you folks use, who, who doesn't have Facebook, right? You notice that Facebook now has running video. If your, your protocols are updated, they have running videos in the background. That's using it without you even pressing play anymore. And that's basically, if your feeds are anything like mine, every three posts is some kind of video running on the background. That's using up bandwidth that you didn't really say, yes, I want, right? Things like that is just eating it up. Um, small stuff. Credit card machines, stuff that we don't even think about. If you're a, a service provider or merchant, 
you're running credit card machines. The processing centers, probably about 10 years ago, started pushing people to using the internet connection for the credit card machines instead of using uh, analog line. It's faster, it's, they, they use a VPN connection, it's fast, and it's a very small portion of the bandwidth used in a house or a business, but it's there and it's, how many transactions would you imagine running through a busy storefront? Yeah. Stuff like that, and that's traveling across the network. Small, you know, things like that, um, you have a lot of, I wanna say heartbeat signals. Devices that will tell you, hey, it's working, I'm alive. You know, this, let's say, oh, what's it? Here, here's a good example. Security cameras. You're starting to see commercials of uh, security systems. You can monitor your security of your home via the internet, from work, or mobile, or what have you. Get all that in HD. Let's say five cameras in a home, all pushed across your internet connection. Right? That doesn't impact your home if you're not home to use it but it's also using out the bandwidth that's crossing over the terrestrial fiber. Okay. Think of things like, you know, things like that. It's the kind of things that Jason has to plan for. And so do we, for that matter. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on, Ron. So, no, no problem. So going back to the quality of service statement, um, quality of service only works when it is consistent end to end. So imagine going through, see I have you know, Roadrunner at home, once Roadrunner hits, say, Hawaiian Tell, and then hits, you know, wherever it needs to go, all of that has to agree on in terms of uh, a quality of service tag. Um, and if that doesn't happen, your, your packet gets going, you know, best effort at that point. So, uh, like David said, the best solution at this point, I think, is just to throw more bandwidth at the problem. And if, you, if you're not congested, you won't have a problem. I understand we're going from 50 megabits per second to 100 and then 500, and then to our gate to the home. But what kind of key indicators should we, should we get in terms of the ability to handle content? Uh, uh, what, what sort of futuristic uh, applications do you guys see for the home or for the business? Uh, I I think a lot of the um, the speeds that are, are coming up, you know, it's, I have, I think I have 15 at home, I'm not sure what I have, um, but it's going to increase, they have 100 megs now, and a lot of it depends on the, the physics of the uh, the cabling coming to your, your house. The next step, of course, would be um, fiber optics, and at that point, you can increase to whatever you, whatever the provider can offer. Uh, I think what what's coming out is now more of the smart home things. Um, like your refrigerator talking to you, or you know, a door alarm, you get notifications on your phone, uh, the always connected house. So that's going to be chewing up a lot of um, small bits of you know, bandwidth, but if you multiply it that over an entire residential area, it's, it's quite a bit coming out of each neighborhood. Uh, so, Iran, uh, as far as getting more, what do I see as far as more bandwidth? Uh, even if we provided a gig today, which there's, there's no technical limitation to provide that service, but this iPad that I have can only do 50 megabits. So even if you had all the bandwidth, it really depends what you're gonna use it for. So for consumers, if they're just gonna do their surfing on their iPad, it'll run great, but they're gonna be limited more on their device. If you're Chris and you're running your backups, yeah, you totally need that one gig connection. So it's hard for me to predict the future as far as what new things will come out there, but people will find ways to come up with products and services that utilize that bandwidth that will either make our lives easier or in some cases more complex. So for your 50 megabit iPad, what kind of service do you need? Would a 50 be or you need 100? How about what's the ratio? To be able to really get okay, so Iran's, and are you saying just from uh, my company's viewpoint, or just in general? Because I got to give general answers. <laughs> uh, so I actually have a 50 megabit service at home, and so I can even through Wi-Fi I can get the the 50 meg speed. But as soon as I go into another room, the Wi-Fi connection itself really limits me more than anything else. I would say it's not going to be the, the speed of the bandwidth. Look at where you're trying to connect to. If you're connecting to servers that are heavily utilized, you're not going to get that 50 megabit speed or 100 or what have you. And a lot of times, it, they're heavily overutilized, and your your drops and stuff is not going to be 
less on your side, more on the servers on the back end side. Yeah. Look, look, think about the end to end stuff. It's good to have, I'd like to have a gig. I could probably make use of it because I got, I can push out a lot of stuff that would make use of it, but I really don't need it because most of the servers I'm connecting to are busy doing transactions for other people also. Right. Think about things like that. Um, my overall thought on that is if you have a 50 gig or uh, 50 megabit iPad, 10 or, you know, sorry. <laughs> I know more bandwidth is good, but, you know, 10 or 20 is actually really good. Right. The question is where are your servers? Where are you accessing the data from? Is the spikiest traffic is running video? Video is actually not that, that spiky. It's actually pretty pretty stable as far as, as long as you can get there, it's very stable. It's Spiky stuff is um, you know, web pages. Think about it. The web pages only updates once when you land on it, unless you have a lot of apps that are running constant updates and feeds. It, it sends it once, and then it sits there. It doesn't do anything until you actually go to another web page, or you hit refresh, or again, you have an application or a code on it that refreshes it automatically. It's a very static type of use, the bandwidth. Oh, bandwidth demand, it's hard to say you know, individually on the, house, on the house level. If you were to ask me in a, like say in a residential area or something, yeah, it's gonna be, video's gonna be spiky because people are coming on and off as they go. Yeah. Um, I kind of have an idea what I wanna say, but I've been hogging the mic, so. You want to start? Okay. <laughs> All right, so the question is, well, from a service provider standpoint, where do you see, or what growth curve do you see uh, on internet or bandwidth usage, uh, even as it relates to higher education or education in general? So what we've been seeing from a pretty consistent standpoint is bandwidth utilization or consumption increases at a clip of about 3% per month. Uh, and notice I'm talking percentages and not necessarily uh, megabits or gigabits. So every three, or I'm sorry, every month is 3%. So you're adding between um, at least 30 to 50% every year. So when you say it's doubling, uh, you know, every two years, that makes absolutely uh, perfect sense as far as how internet's uh, growing. And that growth curve has been pretty consistent. Uh, over the past four or five years. So at least from a HT standpoint, we don't see it changing much because what we like to do is find other ways to mitigate that growth. Uh, caching obviously is one answer to that. Um, yeah, so to follow up on Jason's comment, it's the caching I think that's gonna save a lot of the, um, the bandwidth going forward. If we can get the content locally here, um, we only have to transmit it down once or receive it once, and then we can re replicate it out from a central repository you know, within the state um, and save on our bandwidth costs to mean then. So um, you know, if, you, if the DOE, you know, if, you, if you have those services out there that you receive over the internet, if you can figure a way to, to cache that locally in your data center, that would save, save you guys a tremendous amount of bandwidth going to the internet. Um, it's gonna take uh, it, it's going to be based on your company's policy. Like, I can only speak for ours. So we provision bandwidth to the state. Um, I mentioned it earlier. We're at 140 gigabits. Uh, we're adding 80 more gigabits should be online by January. We kind of have an idea where we're going to be the year after that, and it's, it's a lot higher. Um, but it, it's going to be what is your company comfortable with with an overhead for usage. We, we base it on usage. Um, we start... Once we hit like a 60% capacity, we start looking at upgrading already. And that's just, that's just based on, well, actually, that was a prior company's, that's now been acquired policies, but we'll see what the new one does. 